What a treat. Well, I thought we needed something to celebrate your future. The Tatler Twins Hours is going to be a smash hit. Try one. Did you bake them? Guests. Ah, uh, Perry Como. Dinosaur. Oh, I adore Dinosaur. We were never allowed to play her records. Mother said she was high yellow. Something so seemingly innocuous can cause such damage. Oh, God. Oh, I can't hear her. Oh, it hurts. Oh, it hurts. Please, you have to get us to a hospital. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, my God, it hurts. Please, 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 please. What? Watch our figure, if we're going to be television personalities. following me your family is in danger <sighs> what happened to you pretty aren't I it's over 70 percent of my body I'm Larry Harvey and you have to get out of that house I could have you arrested you know peeking in people's windows is still a crime even in LA they're not gonna put me back into jail I have brain cancer it's terminal Inoperable. I'm sorry. Don't be. That's the only reason they let me out. Homicide. Triple homicide. I was in that house for six months before I started hearing voices. My wife thought I was working too hard. My daughter, Angie, was six. The older one, Margaret, was ten. She looked like her mother. That's funny how it skips a generation like that. I killed them. Oh. Lorraine was ill that night. She took a pill. Uh, she went to bed early, my wife. And then I, uh, I put the girls down. And then 
The voice has started. They told me what to do. I was like an obedient child. I don't know how I put myself out. I remember that night, but it's like a dream. Have you been sleepwalking? Yeah. Look at my case. Read the transcript. Listen to me. I'm a doctor. They may not put you back in jail, but I can certainly have you committed to a state mental institution. And trust me, those places make prison look like Club Med. Leave. My family alone, do you hear me? Please, please, you have to get out of there! That place is evil. Get off of me! Leave us alone! Leave us alone! Eighty percent of the country remains undecided. <laughs> how quickly I can kill. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Russell Edgington, and I have been a vampire for nearly 3,000 years. Now, the American Vampire League wishes to perpetrate the notion that we are just like you, and I suppose in a few small ways we are. We're narcissists. We care only about getting what we want, no matter what the cost, just like you. Global warming, perpetual war, toxic waste, child labor, torture, genocide. That's a small price to pay for your SUVs and your flat screen TVs, your blood diamonds, your designer jeans, your absurd garish McMansions. Futile symbols of permanence to quell your, your quivering, spineless soul. But no, in the end, we are nothing like you. We are <laughs> immortal <laughs> because we drink the true blood, blood that is living, organic, and human. Hmm. And that is the truth the AVL wishes to conceal from you. Because let's face it, eating people is a tough sell these days, so they put on their friendly faces to pass their beloved VRA. But make no mistake, mine is the true face of vampires! Why would we seek equal Rise. You are not our equals. We will eat you after we eat your children. Now time for the weather. Tiffany? Pretty humbling feeling when you realize you have nowhere to go. And what's out there for me? I got no money, no friends I can crash with. Pretty hard to explain away a 20-year gap in my resume. 
And I've got a floppy appendage between my legs, which keeps me from wearing pencil skirts. We all have our flaws, kitten. I thought you were an actor. You don't have to have a resume to be beautiful or talent to be an actor. Just ask Lawrence Harvey. I'm not an actor. Four years of auditioning, and I booked one under five on the Colby's. You need a little moonshine. I did get to work with Charlton Heston, though. Not everyone can say that. I don't even have a room at this hotel. I've got nothing. No one. For eternity. No pity party in my bar. Especially when the guest of honor can't see that he's the luckiest man who ever checked into the Hotel Cortez. Do you think you've tasted humility out there in the streets? You ain't tasted shit, young man. I know. Because I have. You should be ashamed of yourself for abusing your mother. I abused her. I do not deny that that woman is horrible. Horrible. But in the next hundred years of living, you may find someone who treats you better, who screws you better, who makes you laugh more than cry. You'll never find anyone who loves you as much as she does. Now to our award. Here are the nominees for best performance by a featured actor in a play. Thomas Jefferson Bird, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman, Long Day's Journey Into Night. Robert Sean Leonard, Long Day's Journey Into Night. Dennis O'Hare, Take Me Out. And Daniel Sunjata, Take Me Out. And the American Theatre Wing's Tony Award goes to Dennis O'Hare, Take Me Out. Dennis O'Hare takes home his first Tony Award for his portrayal of Mason Marzak in Take Me Out. Ay, ay, ay. Um, uh, I have to do one thing. I'm sorry, forgive me. I have to do this. Um, I never have any joy in my life. Um, I don't allow myself to feel joy. Richard Greenberg taught me how to feel joy. He gave me this character named Mason Marzak. He jumps up and down every night. I never do that in my life. So I had to jump up and down once in my life. Um, my beautiful boyfriend, Hugo Redwood, is here. He supports me. I want to just thank him. Right behind him is Daniel Sunjata, who is my scene partner. So half the award is his because, you know, acting is a team sport. We have the best. We have the best team in the world, Neil Huff, Fred Weller, Kevin Carroll, um, Robert, Robert Jimenez, Jean Gabriel, um, James Yagashi, David Eigenberg, Cole Suddeth, and Joe Lisi. I didn't forget anybody, did I? No. Phew. Um, Joe Mantello, who dresses well and is an amazing director. Um, and um, my parents are celebrating their 50th anniversary. They came all the way from Virginia to be here. My family is here, Mike, Pat, Pam, Kathleen, the dog. And sorry, sorry, Gary, sorry, Gary. And uh, my parents are here. I just want to say happy anniversary. This is for you, for being so patient with your son. Thank you. A fine... No one knows the whole story. I think given her history, it's pretty clear what happened. When did you guys talk to her last? Me? Yeah, I mean, both of you. I don't, I don't know if I'm up for this. Glad you came. Of course I came. From the minute you called, I knew what this was.
I mean, what was she even doing here? She was doing the visiting nurse thing. You know, but why here? I haven't told the girls anything. Or Carl. I'm just trying to get all the information I can. We don't know what really went on. I think that she was in a moment where everything looked hopeless. I just think it's important that we all be honest with each other. It was an accident. That's what they said, right, Dad? And I'm her brother. Everything I said I meant, I'm not apologizing. Why do you think I'm here? She was my wife. She was unique. She was so, so smart. And so loving. When you were with her, it was like no time passed at all. All the money that I spent, I spent it in good company. So filled to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Astonishing. Isn't it just? Now this one seems less pristine than the other. Hmm. That's because she went first. Uh, that won't affect the price, will it? May I ask? How did they expire? Would you believe it? The droopy one caught a cold. Pink cupcakes. Oh, what a treat. Well, I thought we needed something to celebrate your future. The tap of Twins Hours is going to be a smash hit. Try one. Did you bake them? Guests. Ah, uh, Perry Como. Dinosaur. Oh, I adore Dinosaur. We were never allowed to play her records. Mother said she was high yellow. Something so seemingly innocuous can cause such damage. Oh, God. Oh, I can't hear her. Oh, it hurts. Oh, it hurts. Please, you have to get us to a hospital. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, my God, it hurts. Please, 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 please. Dad? Cupcake. I don't want a cupcake. Please. Dad, wake up. Wake up, please. I beg of you. Please help me. Please. Ow. Ow. Oh. You should have had a cupcake. They're to die for. Did you bake them? With my own two hands. No cupcakes. We have to watch our figure. If we're gonna be television personalities. 
night. And why are you following me? Your family is in danger. <sighs> what happened to you? Pretty, aren't I? It's over 70% of my body. I'm Larry Harvey, and you have to get out of that house. I could have you arrested, you know. Peeking in people's windows is still a crime, even in LA. They're not gonna put me back into jail. I have brain cancer, terminal, Inoperable. I'm sorry. Don't be. That's the only reason they let me out. Homicide. Triple homicide. I was in that house for six months before I started hearing voices. My wife thought I was working too hard. My daughter, Angie, was six. The older one, Margaret, was ten. She looked like her mother. That's funny how it skips a generation like that. I killed them. Oh. Lorraine was ill that night. She took a pill. Uh, she went to bed early, my wife. And then I, uh, I put the girls down. And then the voices started. They told me what to do. I was like an obedient child. I don't know how I put myself out. I remember that night, but it's like a dream. Have you been sleepwalking? Yeah. Look at my case. Read the transcript. Listen to me. I'm a doctor. They may not put you back in jail, but I can certainly have you committed to a state mental institution. And trust me, those places make prison look like Club Med. Leave. My family alone, do you hear me? Please, please, you have to get out of there! That place is evil. Get off of me! Leave us alone! Leave us alone! Eight percent of the country remains undecided. <laughs> how quickly I can kill. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Russell Edgington, and I have been a vampire for nearly 3,000 years. Now, the American Vampire League wishes to perpetrate the notion that we are just like you, and I suppose in a few small ways we are. We're narcissists. We care only about getting what we want, no matter what the cost, just like you. Global warming, perpetual war, toxic waste, child labor, torture, genocide. That's a small price to pay for your SUVs and your flat screen TVs, your blood diamonds, your designer jeans, your absurd garish McMansions. 
futile symbols of permanence to quell your your quivering spineless souls but no in the end we are nothing like you we are <laughs> immortal <laughs> because we drink the true blood blood that is living organic and human hmm. and that is the truth the avl wishes to conceal from you because let's face it eating people is a tough sell these days so they put on their friendly faces to pass their beloved vra but make no mistake mine is the true face of vampires! Why would we seek equal rights? You are not our equals. We will eat you after we eat your children. Now time for the weather. Tiffany? I thought you left us for good. pretty humbling feeling when you realize you have nowhere to go. And what's out there for me? I got no money. No friends I can crash with. Pretty hard to explain away a 20-year gap in my resume. And I've got a floppy appendage between my legs, which keeps me from wearing pencil skirts. We all have our flaws, kitten. I thought you were an actor. You don't have to have a resume to be beautiful or talent to be an actor. Just ask Lawrence Harvey. I'm not an actor. Four years of auditioning and I booked one under five on the Colby's. Hey everybody, I'm Dominic Mancini. I'm the owner of Full Empire Promotions and I'll be your host for this special Q&A with Dennis O'Hare. We're live on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. Following this, Dennis will be doing uh, live um, personal video meet and greets over at Zoom. So if you'd like five minutes of uh, time with Dennis, you can go to fullempirepromotions.com and click on his store. There you'll be able to buy your Zoom session as well as autographs and personal video greetings. Following the Q&A, the, the sales will end for the Zoom meet and greets. So this is your last opportunity to do that if you would like one. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our special guest. He's my friend, my client talented playwright, star of such shows as American Horror Story, True Blood, This Is Us, and The Good Wife, as well as films such as The Pyramid, The Proposal, Town the Dreaded Sundown, and The Postcard Killings. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis O'Hare. Hey there. Hey, Dennis. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining. You? My pleasure. Good. Good. My pleasure. Yeah. How so everybody? Many... I can't hear you. Where are you? Can I hear them? Where are they? No, you can't, you can't hear them. I'm sure they're. I'm sure they're cheering though. Yay! So, for people who don't know, Dennis has uh, recently relocated uh, to Paris, France. It's right there. It's right outside. You can't see it. It's right there. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I'll turn you around. There, there's France. Uh, right there. Right at that window. It looks very French. That's Paris. Yeah. So it's a little bit later for you. So thanks for uh, coming on. Yeah. Later for us. And at night. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, I want to talk about your background a little bit. You were born in Kansas City, uh, but you yeah. were raised in Detroit. Is that correct? That's right. No, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a thoroughly Midwestern person. In fact, I used to always joke that I was born in Kansas City, raised, I mean, as their size two, and then raised in Detroit for 16 years, and then I went to school in Chicago. So I spent, you know, the first 30 years of my life, 35 years of my life in the Midwest. And so when anybody ever talks about, you know, Midwestern people or flyover states, I'm like, uh, hello, that's me. Be careful. It's me. And you're an East Coaster, Dom. I know. Yeah, Philly. Yeah, you so are. Very close. 
Yeah. So what gave you the acting bug, Dennis? When did you, when was it in your life where you, where you discovered that you wanted to pursue acting as a profession? Oh, geez. Uh, you know, it's for me, it was always mixed in with music. So the, the, the two for me weren't separated. I was, um, uh, my mom was a musician. Um, my favorite aunt was a musician. She was a cellist married to a violinist who played in the Detroit Symphony. Um, I had a cousin who's a pianist and my grandmother was a music, musician, a cellist as well. So we sort of had that in the family. And so I started playing organ and piano when I was five. Um, I used to play church organ when I was eight at our, our weekday masses and um, play guitar masses. I'm Catholic um, growing up, uh, you know, 12 o'clock mass and had my own organ slot when I was about 17 at a church until I got fired. Um, but so I was always doing that. And also always singing. I started singing in Bach choirs when I was 12. And then, you know, I did a play when I was eight, I think. Um, I'm not sure that gave me the bug because I played a pig and I had to wear pink tights and a Campbell, Campbell soup nose and it was not very pleasant and like being a pig. So um, uh, I guess when I was about 12 or 13, I joined a summer theater in Southfield, Michigan, and we did uh, Carousel musical. And uh, that kind of launched me. And the next year we did Showboat. And then uh, I started doing the musicals in my, my high school. So I think I was a high school you know, musical guy. And uh, I also did plays. And then when I was about 16, I went to Cranbrook Theater Institute, which is a big arts colony in Detroit, um, especially north of Detroit, or Cranbrook. And um, there I sort of got introduced into Stanislavski and real sort of like acting as a school of thought and a philosophy. And um, that was it, you know, I mean, it kind of launched me. Right, right, so the theater kind of leads into film usually. Yeah. Now, one of your earlier films, you did a film called The Changeling, which not to be confused with the, the horror film with George C. Scott, this was directed <laughs> by, uh, by Clint Eastwood. So I know you've had kind of a smaller role in it, but did you have any kind of interactions with Mr. Eastwood? And what was, what was it like being on that set with him? I had a great time in that movie. You know, I've done two movies with him. I did, I did J. Edgar as well. And, uh, you know, he, he's a funny guy. I mean, I really, really, really like him as a person and I really, really like him as a director. I think he's, um, he's smart. Um, he's gentle. Um, he doesn't say a lot. Um, you know, the, the thing about Clint Eastwood movies normally are that you shoot only six hours. And normally in a movie, you shoot like six hours you take a lunch break for an hour and a half and you come back and you shoot six or seven hours. It's about a 14 hour day. Right. Clint is famous for never taking lunch. You get to lunch and everyone goes home. And so studios love him, budgets love him. And part of that, it just comes from the fact that he doesn't really ask for a lot of takes. Um, and it's not because he doesn't care, it's that he casts really well. He casts really good actors usually, he trusts the actor and he doesn't want to, sort of beat a dead horse in a weird way. Um, he'll just do it a couple of times and he feels like he got it, he'll move on. If he doesn't have the shot, he's not gonna move on. But you know, for the most part, he, he's not, a, he's not a, a kind of a perfectionist in that way that some directors can be. Um, he also composes a lot of his own music. So I know that for, uh, I know for Jay Edgar, I think he um, composed a jazz score for that, a lot of the jazz for that, um, which I, I find phenomenal. My favorite funny story about Changeling was, you know, Amy Ryan and um, who's in that as well, Angelina Jolie's patient who I'm sort of um, abusing by committing her into this insane asylum, even though she isn't insane. And Amy Ryan, someone who I've also sort of been um, maltreating. And um, at one point, Amy had to hit me in the hallway. She had to punch me. And, you know, normally you do a punch scene like that. You're like, okay, so where's the choreographer, the fight choreographer? Where, how are we going to do this? Is there a pad? Uh, are we going to fake it? And, you know, how are we going to do it? And, and Clint went, well, you know, she'll punch you. And you'll just go. And I was like, I can't do that. I can't pull off a Clint Eastwood, you know, thing. And so... <laughs> She hit me. That's what happened. She punched me. There was no oh, acting. No. I just got punched. You know, that what, was a, what, a way, what a way to be introduced. It know? was great. You have to act. A toughened you up. Being in a close yes. Yes. Yeah. So you also did a movie I like called The Pyramid, which uh, oh, yeah. you shot in Cairo. Was it Cairo, Egypt? No, we were in Morocco. It was Morocco. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, there's a place called Where Zazat. Where is Zazat, Morocco, which is famous for um, one of the sets for Gladiators and also Game of Thrones. And a lot of the Game of Thrones people were there. We were there. We stayed at the one hotel in Where Zazat called the Berber Palace. And um, it's sort of where all the, the big Hollywood team stay. Um, that was crazy. It was a crazy thing. Uh, you know, the movie is, 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 I'm glad I did it. I love the producer. I love my, my castmates. Um, um, it was fun to be in the desert. We did about a week outside in the real desert. And then we did the rest of it on a, a studio, a lot, you know, a pretty amazing studio. I thought, um, at one point there's like a sand trap that comes in and buries everybody alive. You know, spoiler alert. Yeah. But in that one, it was it was actually real sand pouring in, and you actually was sort of burying you. Um, they controlled it, but it was scary. There were a lot of things like that that were sort of like, "Wow, this is full on scary." Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's an intense movie. It really is. Was that your first time going to Egypt? Uh, in Morocco? Uh, no, you know I've been to Morocco. Gosh, I shot Charlie Wilson's War in Morocco. Um, I shot, uh, before that, I did a Nick Cage movie called um, uh, Army of One in Morocco. So I've actually been there a lot. I was just in Morocco this past December for uh, for Christmas. So I, I spent a, a lot of time in Morocco. Uh, and oddly enough, I had been to Egypt. I also shot in Cairo. I didn't shoot in Cairo. I did my one-man show in Cairo. That's what I'm confusing you with. I remember you saying yeah. that. No, I, I had been in oh. Cairo, yeah, and, which is Egypt, which I, which I, I adore. I was in Cairo and Alexandria, and then we were down south. Um, in some of the um, uh, Luxor, which is a big uh, temple town, amazing place. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned that, uh, your your one man show is it an Iliad? An Iliad. An Iliad. Uh, can you an talk Iliad. a little bit about that and all the different places you've been with it? Yeah, you know, it's a play that I co-wrote with my co-creator Lisa Peterson. Uh, she's a director, and we met in nineteen, you know, or a long time ago in Chicago when she hired me to play a gnome. I played a twisted gnome under a stairway. And uh, it was a really cool play called The Author's Voice by a guy named Richard Greenberg, who I ended up working with in Take Me Out in 2003. I did a play of his on Broadway. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, um, Lisa and I re-met years later and she asked me to sit down with her and read The Iliad, which is the famous poem by Homer about the Trojan War. And we did, and we started working on a play. And it took us, I don't know, five years, six years <laughs> to write it. And uh, we ended up doing it in Seattle and then the McCarter in Princeton, New Jersey. And then we did it in New York Theater Workshop in New York. I performed it with another actor named Steven Spinella. We took turns doing it. It's a very difficult piece. And then since then, I've toured it. And uh, I've done it in Santiago, Chile. Um, I've done it in New Orleans, I did it in New York, in uh, Los Angeles, did it in Arizona, did it in Dartmouth, did it in Williamstown, uh, we did it in Abu Dhabi, wow. I did it in Romania, I did it in Cairo, I did it in Shanghai, um, and funnily enough, we were just invited back to Beijing and Hong Kong right when all this COVID stuff hit, so we now, and we had to cancel, but we want to go back, we're dying to go back there. Um, uh, yeah, we've been all over the world with this play. Australia, I've been to Australia twice. We were in Perth, we were in Adelaide, and then Wellington. And um, I usually take my husband and my son, so it's a whole family thing. And uh, Lisa's girlfriend is the set designer, so she always comes. And so we're, we're a real team, and our musician, Brian. It's a real interesting, and we did it in Paris in January. So we did it for nine times in Paris. We had a, a really great run here in Paris, just wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So do you do it in all different languages or is there an interpreter or is it? Is it you know, we, we have it translated and we have uh, super titles or subtitles. So as an audience member, if you don't speak um, English, we'll do it in Arabic. You know, we'll have it up there. Um, we translate it into French, into Romanian, into Spanish. Um, I always learn a section in whatever language I'm uh, in, whatever country I'm in. So there's one section in the play where we talk about towns where soldiers came from. And I learned that section. It's probably about 20 lines, maybe more, in whatever language I'm in. So I've done it in Spanish, I've done it in Romanian, I've done it in, um, uh, I did it in Arabic, I did it in wow. Mandarin. The Mandarin was the one that almost killed me. It was just so hard. <laughs> it was like barely in my head and gone the next day, like pink, gone. 
And when we did it in Paris, you know, I speak French fluently. So yeah. I did a, I did a lot more of the play in French. Uh, I actually did, um, I don't know, maybe 15% of the play in French, as opposed to just that one section. And it was good for me because I know what I'm saying. I actually can understand what I'm, what I'm doing. And it's just great for an audience to hear a performer speaking in their language to them. It's a mark of respect, but it also stops them from reading. So they get to really uh, experience the play directly one-on-one. -on -one. And that, that's why we do it. Right. Right. Well, hopefully I get to see it someday. I'd like to see it, uh, you know, next time. You know, and, and have, we do have a PBS. We did it for PBS and we do have a link, which we can't show because we've had a hard time. Um, PBS showed it once, but we have a, a little bit of a broadcast contractual issue showing it on our own. So I can show it for educational purposes, but I can't show it for profit. You know, right. Which, do anyway but it's a beautiful production of it and um you know we were hoping to do it in new york again at some point um as i say i've done it throughout the united states uh i would love to do it in colleges i might come back and do it in colleges there it's a play about you know the madness of folly of war and violence and why is it that we continue to use violence to solve our problems that's what it's about yeah well yeah hopefully next time it comes to new york i can i can check it out Yes. So I want to go back to another film you did, which uh, I'm a big fan of the original. You did uh, a version of The Town the Dreaded Sundown. Yes. Your, your version, your movie was kind of a hybrid uh, remake sequel, which was kind of cool. Totally. You, don't, you don't see that very often. Usually it's a prequel or just a direct remake or, or sequel. So had you had you seen the original? Were you aware of the original before you became involved? I, I did see the original. I saw it. You know, it, it's, a, it's one of those iconic movies that, um, you know, because it was groundbreaking and it created the genre in a way it's hard to judge now it's like when you look at old sci-fi movies and you go but look you can see the you know the strings the point is is that at the time it was a movie that was as fresh as it gets and you know the town of Dreaded sundown is a scary movie it's just it's scary it, it, it it's like hitchcock it really knows how to create with a little bit of a costume or a little bit of lighting a really freaky situation um, I loved our version. I love the director, um, Alfonso Gomez Rejon, who I met on American Horror Story. Um, first, I met him in a movie called The Eagle. He directed me in Budapest in a movie called The Eagle. He was the second unit director. And then uh, he did a lot of second unit and first unit stuff in American Horror Story. He did um, a lot of the third season of Horror Story, a lot of the second season and a lot of the first season. I loved him as a director. And he asked me to do this for him. And um, it was it was crazy, you know. My my character was the was the real son of uh, Charles Pierce, who was one of the original. Um, I think director. Or, I think it was a director. He was a director of the original. Yeah. Director. So it was his actual son who I was playing, so who I met. So I went and I interviewed him and met him, and he's you know he's a he's a crazy dude. I played you know I played this broken down alcoholic in a in a trailer park and wasn't far from the truth um but a really interesting man and uh, i didn't want to exploit him but i wanted to kind of honor him and um so the movie really does weave in and out of reality and fiction and Al i mean alfonso is a great director he's just yeah. a, a great director i thought he did a great job yeah so supposedly the phantom killer in real life was never caught uh did, did anybody have any theories on set or what's your theory do, do you think he just kind of escaped and died of old age somewhere or do you think he was the suspect they thought they caught. You know, I, I don't have a I don't have a good theory. I don't not better than anyone else's. But if he didn't get caught, I'm sure he's dead by now. I can't imagine he's still alive. And um, uh, you know, we can only hope that he came to a bad end. Yeah, he was a he was a nasty guy. He deserved it. Yeah. yeah. So one of one yeah. of your most one of the roles you're most known for is probably um, Russell Edgington from True Blood. Oh. Oh, you seem like, like you were having so much fun playing that character, I and mean, he was. No, it's an amazing character. I mean, you know, it was it was an amazing show. It's funny because I was a fan of the show before I did it. So I I got introduced to it by a friend of mine named Don Don Robinder, and he gave us some bootleg VHS tapes. That's how long ago it was. And I remember we had him sitting around the house, and I was like, "What is this thing? True Blood vampires." And so we, we popped it in and I wasn't really hooked in the first episode. And then I really got hooked. It just, you know, wolves, werewolves, fairies, vampires. It kind of had it all, sex. And um, I like the style. I like the writing. Uh, never 
ever in my wildest dreams thought I would be on the show. And I, I, you know, there wasn't a part for me. And then I was doing the movie in Prague, uh, where I was working with Alfonso, um, the Eagle of the Ninth. And uh, I got a phone call from my agent. And he was like, uh, you know, how would you like to be the vampire king of Mississippi? I was like, what? What? He goes, on True Blood. And I was like, sure. I, yeah, I, that'd be amazing. Sure. And that was it. And uh, I, you know, I always do a lot of preparation for my roles. And uh, I... I got a dialect coach. I paid for him because they didn't want to really spring the money. They gave me one session. I was like, no, 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 I need more than that. And, um, you know, we did a lot of background research on who I think this guy was, read the books, um, met the guy who played my lover, Talbot, um, Theo Alexander, a great actor from you know, from uh, Greece. And we spent time together talking about our characters and creating our backstory and how we met and what we think of how we met. And uh, And then, you know, I got to play with that amazing cast. You know, Sam Trammell and Nelson Ellis and um, Stephen Moyer and Anna Paquin and, you know, Alex Skarsgård and Carrie Preston. It was a great Just cast. Amazing actors. You know, uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Kristen uh, Bauer. Just uh, Chris Bauer, my God. Just Ryan Quanton. They keep coming to me. Even you know, the guest stars like Robert Patrick and Rutger Hauer. You know, they, they, yes, they just yeah, had really, yes. it was just a real great cast. Both who I got to meet and work with. And both both lovely guys, by the way. But um, yeah, it was, it was an amazing cast that way. And I, I, you know, the writing was really, really good. So it wasn't like we were rewriting things, but the writers sort of wrote into us as they watched what we were doing. And there was a writer named Alex Wu, who was one of my favorites. Um, I mean, they're all great. It's hard to pick one. But Alex wrote the, um, the great episode where I ripped the spine out of the newscaster. Oh. And um, I got that script about two weeks before we shot it. And I read it and I was like, oh my God. And I worked that speech backwards and forwards. I had that thing down cold. I knew what I wanted to do with that thing. They knew how important it was going to be. And um, we came and shot it. We only shot it about four times because it was such an elaborate setup. It took so much to get everything ready. And there was so much blood everywhere. And the cameras had to be covered in plastic. Everybody had to wear ponchos because it was blood flying. So it was very difficult. To uh, to set up, so we only did four takes, but um, it was it was so so amazing. I love that show. I love that show. Yeah, it definitely has its following. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, the one in the vampire tales now. People love it. And did you have any kind of influence as far as like cinematic vampires for that role? Because he was kind of like a like a, a, a vampire politician who just loved the power that he had. He wasn't like a stereotypical vampire, you know, no. black and. He was, he was, you know, just a fun character. Did you? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's, it's hard to know where we end and where the characters begin. And, you know, somebody else could have looked at that script and maybe they would have gone a different way. And I looked at the books and I, I didn't really think that the character in the books was something interesting. I thought he was too mousy. And I, I wanted him to be this crazy, powerful person. And, you know, to me, the idea that the, he's the oldest vampire, older than Godric, means something. It meant that he was powerful, but it also meant that he was, he was unknowable. He was not a modern mind. You know, the, 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 the trick you have to do when you play these characters is to really consider, you know, if somebody was born in 1000 BCE, what does that mean? What kind of mind do they have? How do they see the world? What is their thinking? What is their, what is their frame? What is their worldview? How do they negotiate things? And, um, one of the decisions I came up with early on was that he was illiterate. Of course he was illiterate. He couldn't read and write. There's absolutely no way he can read and write. And so that informed some of my choices in scenes where I had documents. I would always just kind of go, ah, read that, read that. I'm not going to read that. Just couldn't read. Um, and, um, you know, there, I, and I didn't really base him on anybody. I sort of, he was based on himself. He was based on the scripts. The scripts are really, really well written. Alan Ball is an amazing writer, Nancy Oliver. Um, and they led me. I just looked at the clues in the script and picked it up from there. And then, you know, the director will give you a nudge here and there. And Alan Ball will certainly talk to me about the character and what he thought about the character. And he really, really um, pushed me in the right direction, I thought. But uh, I, I loved it. I just loved it. Yeah. And, and you came on while the show was already in production. As you said, you were a fan of it before. before. Yeah. Been, uh, cast in the show. How welcoming were the, the uh, actors already on the show? Were they were they receptive to you coming on? Were they? Well, they were great. 
you know, it, it's funny. We all sort of know each other anyway. Um, I knew Carrie Preston a little bit. Um, we all know each other from different things. Most of us are theater actors, so we, we, we've, we've, in, we've you know, been involved with each other somehow. Um, Chris Bauer's wife's a costume designer. I knew her from something I had done. So we, we all sort of are mixed in. Um, I was nervous because I, I thought that the show was beautiful and amazing, and I didn't want to break it. I didn't want to be the guy who came in and, you know, tank True Blood. Right. Um, and, you know, in season two, I thought it was so great with Michelle Forbes. And I knew I was sort of the baddie of season three. And I was like, oh, my God, how can I compete with Michelle Forbes? She's so great. You know, and ironically, Fiona Shaw, who was sort of the baddie in season four, um, I met her before she did it. And she said the same thing to me. She was like, oh, God, I have to be you're, 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 you're blazing this trail before me. It's so intimidating. And Fiona Shaw is like one of the great actors of all time. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's truly. But, uh, you know, it, Everybody was welcoming. It was it was a really really wonderful set. You know, the the people on that show were genuinely hardworking, genuinely friendly. They knew how to have fun. They also knew how when not to have fun, when to settle down and, and be disciplined. It was it's just it was a great pleasure to work on. It really was. Yeah. So of course we have to talk about American Horror Story because a lot of people watch that show, and you did five seasons of it. Yes, we should have those up for sale in the store. I think we have some of those left. You you designed those yourself, correct? I did. That was my cast uh, and crew gift. Uh, at the end of season five, I had them made, and, uh, and I gave them to everybody. Um, I think I made like 150. What, what happened was I had made more than I needed, and that's why I started bringing them to conventions, because I thought, oh, what? And then people liked them, so I, started, I kept making them. But um, Yeah, they're great. Agreed. Yeah. So you, yeah. you did five seasons of the show, and you played all your characters were so different. You know. Like, yeah, were, that's, what, that's what's so great about the show. You know, I I was season one. I was Larry. Um, I wasn't in season two, so I couldn't do it. I had a, a gig that um that conflicted. Season three, I was Spalding. Uh, season four, I was Stanley. Season five, I was Liz. And season six, I was Elias Cunningham, the crazy you know bearded scholar in the basement with a TV set. <laughs> in in the Spoiler. Sorry? I said spoiler. He didn't last yeah. long. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. But um, no, I, that, that show was, you know, when I, when I first did it, uh, nobody knew what it was going to be. And no one had done that before. It really was uh, sui generis. It was, it was the thing that launched this whole idea of same cast, different storyline every season. Or same show, but different plot every season. Um, True Detective also did that. American Crime Story did that. Uh, a lot of people, you know, cottoned on Black Mirror in a weird way, but not really. Um, it's just an idea, of, a different idea of structuring a TV show, which Ryan is so brilliant at. But, um, you know, when I first read it, I had no idea what to make of it, but I loved the ideas. I loved the character of Larry, and I was on board, baby. Yeah, no, you had a great, you had a great run on the show. What, out of the characters that you played, which one would you feel was closest to the real you, and which one <laughs> stays the furthest from the real you? <laughs> wow, you know what? Oddly enough, Larry is closest to me. You know, I have a very, very, very weird affection for Larry. He, he really is a character who I just, I just get. Um, you know, the character who I would say is farthest from me is Liz, um, but. Liz for me was one of the most powerful experiences because I really, once I found the character and did it, I, I just let go and I let her take over. It really was a case of possession. That was the only time in my life as an actor where I had a hard time letting go of the character at the end of the day. And I also occasionally had a hard time separating my life from Liz's life. And that was weird for me. It was very weird for me. Um, but that was a very, very powerful experience for me. Um, but yeah, Larry is, Larry is my heart in that, in that he's something I know really, really, really well. Um, I love, I love the monsters. I like the broken people. I like the, yeah. I like the villains. I like the ones who are, who are underdogs, who are shunned. I love Spalding for that reason. I love the misunderstood people, the misfits. I love playing You're talking that. to me. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I didn't. When I'd watch Coven, I didn't even realize that was you until until he started, until Spalding started speaking. You know, yeah, it was late, it was seven. yeah. 
you know, so um, yeah, great, great characters on that show. And uh, you work with so many talented actors from Jessica Lange to Lance Reddick to Dylan McDermott to Kathy Jack Bates. Bates. Uh, so many, Lady Gaga. I mean, we're, we're, you know, you work with so many amazing uh, talents on that show. Yeah. Were, were there anybody on the show that you that, that was on your season that you wish you had worked with that you hadn't? You know, I got to work with Matt Bomer a little bit. I love Matt, and I wish I had more stuff with him. Cheyenne and I, I love working with him. We got a little bit of stuff. Max Greenfield, I love. I wish I had gotten something with him. Um, you know, I was very happy that Kathy Bates and I got to do as much as we finally got to do because. I hadn't worked with her a whole lot. We had a couple of things in Freak Show and a couple of things in Coven, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have no complaints. I got to work with Jessica Lang, you know, for four seasons uh, yeah. or three seasons, and that was just amazing. I got to work with Lady Gaga, and that was amazing. Paulson with all those seasons. Evan Peters is a joy to work with, really is, as is Finn Whitrock, and so talented. Um, um, I love working with Thaisa Farmiga. We had a great time uh, when we got to work together. Gabby Sidibe, my God, I can't forget Gabby. I adore her. I adore her. Um, yeah, and Danny Houston, you know, he's he's a really good actor. Came yeah, we had many scenes with him, but but he was you no, know, he was no, not, not, not that many, not that many. But you know, um, in the five seasons, you get to work with everybody at some point. Franny Conroy and I got to do stuff together in season one and season three and season six. Yeah, yeah. I I, I loved. I, I got loved the opportunity I got. Yeah. Well, hopefully they bring you back, Ryan Murphy, if you're watching. Yes. Bring Dennis yeah. back. Yes, I'm. 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 I'm available. I fly. Yes. I yeah. can get there. No, I did. Yeah. I did. Um, I did. Uh, what did I do? I did um, American Gods this past year. I did the season three of that. I did uh, about four or five episodes of that. And uh, when they were hiring me, they were like, um, "So you're in France?" And I was like, "I'll take a plane." <laughs> Just like if I'm in New York, I take a plane to LA. I'll right. take a plane. And they were like, right, of course. And it was it all worked out fine. Yeah, I wasn't sure if we could mention that yet, because it hasn't it hasn't really been announced anywhere, but we can um oops. You know, we, can, we didn't hear nothing. Nobody heard anything. What was mentioned? What? Yeah, nobody heard anything. So I want to talk a little bit about some of your, your recent movies. Uh one that I I had watched um that I know was really, really close and personal to you is the parting glass. Actually showed the trailer at the beginning before you came on. Oh great! Oh and, great! And uh, I know this was really you really poured your heart out in this film, and so yeah, that, I'm happy with the way it came out. Very happy, uh, very happy. And you know, talk about connections. Stephen Moyer from True Blood was the person who directed it, and Anna Paquin from True Blood played my little sister in it. Um, Melissa Leo, Cynthia Nixon, um, Ed Asner, Risa Fans. Um, you know, it, it's. It's funny, I started writing that during the pyramid. So we were shooting okay. the pyramid. My little sister killed herself in 2010. And I think it was, gosh, the year after I was in Morocco doing that. And I had been thinking about it and her and the story of that. And I just started writing the screenplay. I just wrote it, you know, like that. I usually am writing whenever I'm working, so I do double duty. And um, I uh, then tried to set about getting it made which is incredibly difficult. And I pitched it to a bunch of people and one of those was Stephen Moyer and he really loved it and got it. And, um, you know, they came on as producers and directors and it wouldn't have happened without them. Uh, Cerise Larkin, who's his um, producing partner. And, um, you know, it's about, it's therapy and it's art. I wrote it as therapy and then when we made it, it was art. Um, it's a movie about my sister's suicide and my family dealing with it and coming together for one day to clean up her apartment because she's dead and they want her stuff out. It's a brutal film. It's really funny. It's really moving, I think, and hope. Yes. Um, and it's really true. It's really authentic. And the highest compliment to me is when everybody sees it and they say, oh my God, that's my family. That's exactly my family. Right. Because that's what we're going for. We're, we're going for identification. You know, I want people to identify and I want to use universal truths to try to help somebody else. And suicide is a hard topic. And it's, uh, it's not one that's discussed in depth a lot. And uh, I felt as somebody who has suffered through it and who has dealt with it, that I had, a, I had a duty in a way to honor my sister, but also to talk about it and help other people talk about it. Yeah, no, it was, you did a great job with it. And the, you. You know, the snowy kind of dark gloomy vibe 
you know, really yeah. started going for it. And he did a but good job. It's, it's funny. Yeah, he did a really good job of recreating um, Missouri, too, because I think you shot that in Ontario, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we shot it in Canada, yeah. Yeah, there was nothing yeah. Canadian about it. Usually, yeah, we, we did pretty well. We had some crazy weather to deal with. You know, shooting a scene with no snow, and then snow shows up, and you're like, uh, how do we justify this? <laughs> And if you if you want to check out the party glass, if you're a fan of Dennis, you should check that out. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. Totally, really strong, powerful film. Yeah. Another another of your recent films that you did, uh, which is I think is a really fun film, is called Danger One. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have to say that the character that you played, Craddock, he's Craddock. probably one of my favorite characters that I've seen you play. Oh, that's so cool. You know, because he's just he's, so great and he's just you know like you, you make you make it so hard not to like not, not to like the villain you know like he's oh, good a great villain he's fun and, and they that, that was the same producer as the pyramid and i love this producer okay. eddie elmatar i just love him and scott silver and i just said i basically do anything for them because i just love them and um he asked me to do it and he said you can make up the character here's a name but it's just you can make him up and i was like mm -hmm. and you know i just kind of threw stuff together and it's funny because I, I i don't know where i got the idea i wanted a wig i just wanted i wanted a toupee i wanted a guy wearing a toupee that wasn't good well i think because he was trying to look younger like the character kind yeah. of had a thing where he was trying to make himself younger I, I just loved it and it was a bad toupee and i just loved the fact that it was a bad toupee i, I just made me so happy um you know uh it, it, yeah it, it was it's funny because the shoot was tough it was a hard shoot we really really sort of had to had to really cram it in there. Um, yeah. But um, again, I love working for Chatty and I love the opportunity to do it. It's a good heist movie, you know? It's, it's, it's fun. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it has those funny moments where you're expecting serious drama, you get like a funny line. I mean, even, oh. even you know, even spoiler, even when you die at the end, you know, you just yes. up before you die is kind of like just crazy. You don't see that in movies. So, no, I, I love that. And, and day one. one. One of the traits for that character was he listened to uh, when he when he shot people when he got angry he put in music like opera music to calm him down. Yes. Did you yeah. music, or did they give you music to listen to or did you? That was me. I, that was all me. That was my idea. I wanted that. You know, I, I'm an opera freak and myself, and so I just thought that you know, and I'm stealing, of course. That's that's from a very famous movie called Diva, um, a movie oh. God, 1984. When is that? Diva is a very old movie, and the character in that. Um, does that and he's this crazy character. It's a French film, and so I sort of stole it from that, um, paying homage to one of my favorite movies. But um, uh, yeah, and I, 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 I just love the idea of opposites that you know, extreme violence, and you have this guy listening to opera, and you don't know what he's listening to at the very end, right? You've no idea what it is, you know. And it actually, for a while there, I played with the idea that he was listening to nothing, that it was just he, there wasn't anything, it was just imagining it. Just static, you know. I love the idea of, yeah. I like I like things like that for characters where you you don't know what's going on in their brains. Exactly. The more you don't know, the, the you know the quirkier and scarier they are. Totally. That's what we're afraid of is mystery. And you also did a recent film called The Postcard Killings, which I which I watched recently. And yeah. I really enjoyed it. It was a you know kind of a, a high ver a high a high budget version of like CSI or or one of those crime shows, except they had a great cast and it. Took Pretty place sick. All over Europe. Yeah, some of that, some of that imagery is really sick in that thing. It's really it disturbing. Yeah. So, do you think? Not. To, I don't want to spoil anything because it's kind of a new movie, so I don't want to spoil yeah. it. Do you think there's any? Uh, the, the ending kind of left it open for a sequel. Maybe you totally. Any kind so, of so I, I'd be open for that. And I, again, you know, it's funny. We we don't often get to praise the producers, you know, but producers are the people who make these things happen. They get an idea, they get a book, they get um, uh, a script, and they spend years developing it and paying people to write things and begging people to pay attention to them and trying to get the money. And then they hire the director, and then they hire the actors. And this is one of those great, this is one of those great producers who I, of course, would do anything for because I like her. And yeah. it's those relationships that we don't always we don't always see behind the scenes. You know, you think of the director, or you think of the star, but it's other people. It's the, it's the crew. It's the cameraman. And you know, this this is one of those. I remember the PA was actually a relative of the producers, Miriam's, Miriam's nephew, and mm -hmm. um, he was just a great guy. I just <laughs> loved him. Um, you know, when we do movies, 
we have relationships. We have a daily relationship with somebody, whether it's hair and makeup or, you know, the first AD or the crew, the crew guy or the PA who runs around and, and helps you out. And, and those people make the experience. And yeah. I have to say in my life, I've been pretty lucky to have had really wonderful people in those, in those capacities. I almost always make friends with people on the crew because they're just great people. Yeah, absolutely. So you have to work with them every day, so you might as well be friendly yeah. with them and make yeah. it a nice experience. So yeah, I enjoyed the postcard killings. Hopefully, there's there's more more story to tell in there with the sequel. It, there's it, more killing there. There's yeah. more killing. Yeah, it might be. Maybe it'll be the text killer. You know, instead of the postcards, you can text now. You know? Now I guess they could trace that. So that wouldn't work. Find a pond, Don. You can find a pond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wouldn't work because they can trace the IP address. Amazing puns. The Punisher. See? See that? So you're in a series coming up uh, on HBO for Josh Whedon called yeah. The Average. And that's been, that's been released and seems like a lot of people are excited about that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the character that you play in The Nevers? I can, a little bit. You know, we, it, it hasn't aired yet. Um, we Whatever we, you can say. I think we shot around five episodes before um, COVID-19 came along. And um, I finished shooting in late February, and then we're going to come back and we have to shoot, I think, uh, six more. And um, that was supposed to be in, you know, May. That didn't happen. <laughs> so we don't know when it's going to happen. We shoot that in London. And uh, I love Joss Whedon. You know, I, again, I feel so lucky to have met and worked with these people. Amazing human being, amazing creator, amazing history of what he's done. I mean, his, his, his oeuvre, as you will, if you will. Is yeah. so spectacular, um, and this is, you know, it's a, it's it's sci-fi, and it, it, but it's also a period piece. I play a scientist, Dr. Edmund Haig, who is um, in pursuit of knowledge in a not altogether wholesome way. That's all I can say. Um, it's a delicious character. I get to wear fantastic clothes. Um, I get to sing a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's just it's truly wonderful this this look is for him although it's gotten out of hand so this has gotten way out of hand it shouldn't be this long and um, i make it people are going to freak out when they see it but this, <laughs> this i had to grow this for the part and so i can't shave it because we can come back to work at any time so i'm stuck with this this zz top look but you know i don't know it's working it's working for you it it's a new thing you know what i mean people are seeing me in a different way a different light Absolutely. Well, hopefully we, you know, you guys can start filming that again and we yeah. see it next year because uh, Josh Whedon definitely has a fan base from all the stuff he did. And looks, you know, I looked at some of the cast and it looks like a really good cast and very good cast. You know, I'd be cast. curious what the, uh, how it's linked back to the title, you know, the Nevers. I guess we'll yeah. find out as we watch it. You'll find out what that means. I can't tell you. Well, we'll find out. So that's all I have. I'm gonna, there's been a couple of fan questions that I'm going to put up on the screen here. Yeah. Hopefully you can see that. So, from Jamie De Niro Williams. She said, uh, hello, massive fan. Love Dennis and AHS. My wife would like to ask you about Finn Wittrock. What was it like kissing Finn? Was it an amazing? Was it as amazing as I'd imagined? Um, <laughs> I find this whole chain interesting. He's asking for his wife, which I find interesting. Yeah. Um, um, you know, it was amazing. Uh, but you know, when you're acting, your mind is going so many different places. And I, I have to tell you that part of my thing is making other people comfortable. And so I was so afraid that Finn would feel uncomfortable that I spent a lot of my energy kind of going, Oh God, I hope he's all right. I hope this is okay. And he was fine. He was totally fine. Um, it was a lot of fun, you know, the, and, but truth to be told, the scenes with him were beautiful to play. We had that one scene in the bed. It was just a beautiful, gorgeous scene. I love playing that scene. On an acting level, Finn is just right there. Fantastic. Yeah, he really um, and the kissing was nice. And when he got up to go stand up, it was nice to be able to look at him. That was great. Right, right. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. I got to meet him briefly at a convention. Yeah. He's, you know, very, very friendly. and Really good actor. My God. He is. I always, I always look for, you know, his work coming out because he's just, you know, he's a good, good actor to watch. So Blair says, yep. Um, yep. not really a question, but Blair says, I love Sarah Paulson. 
Sarah's fantastic. She's fantastic. You know, we were doing a hotel. Uh, she was doing double duty. She was doing the OJ Simpson trial playing Marsha. That's right. And um, my God, it was insane. She would run and, and, and it was all in the same lot, the Fox lot. And so she would run back and forth to do these different shows. I don't know how she did it and gave spectacular performances in both pieces and managed somehow to, you know, I don't know. God, it's just crazy. I would see her sometimes cross-eyed and just think, how are you doing this? Yeah. She's, she's a beast. She's a beast. She is, and, and the characters were so different for her in both of those. So. Amazing, amazing characters. And she did double duty in Freak Show, too, so, you know, two heads. Yes, she did. That was hard for all of us. I can because, imagine. It looked, it looked great, though, the way they had it. It's harder, it's harder on her, of course, but, you know, we had to shoot things four times. You'd have to shoot to that head and then shoot to that head and then do the reverse that head and then that head and you have to keep reminding us that you go no 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 D dennis don't look at sarah talk to the other head oh sorry yes <laughs> you know and, and when she had the heads talking to each other she had to have someone else read the lines it was that was wow. super challenging super challenging wow yeah. yeah so mary beasley says do you still play the piano for fun i do I love the piano. You know, I've been playing again, as I said, since I was five, and um, I play a lot of Bach. Um, I play a lot of Chopin. Um, play a lot of Beethoven, a lot of Mozart. And recently, I've fallen in love with Schumann. Um, there's a series of pieces called Kindersinnen, um, scenes from childhood, and they're so beautiful and hard to play, but not impossible to play. So I'm working on the first and the last one, and. Uh, you know, I sit down and I play not as much as I'd like, but I'll sit down for a half hour at a time and I'll work out uh, my fingering and work out the thing. And I play for myself these days. I don't play for anybody else. But uh, my son and I play sometimes. We play duets. We'll just start improvising and I'll pick out the bass and he'll do the treble or he'll pick out the bass and I'll just, you know, improvise in. And, and we come up with some really beautiful music. It, it actually is really beautiful music. And I follow him because I want to hear his mind. I want to hear what he's doing. It's really interesting. Yeah, I wish I could play the piano someday. I don't, I don't know if I have the patience for it, but, but uh, it, you know. Well, anybody can play, it's about playing well. You just kind of go, bah, 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 you know. Right, that's what I would do, I'm sure, you know. That's so, music. Yeah, that's all the, that looks like that's all the fan questions. There's some comments, just people saying hi. Hi, hey, Dennis with hearts. Um, I don't see any other questions here. So I guess we can wrap this one up. Thank you, Dennis, yeah. for uh, for joining. Anything else you want to say at the end? Any any. Any other projects coming out you want to talk about, or you know, we um, uh, I'm working on uh, another iteration of a play. Lisa and I wrote our play called The Good Book about the Bible, which we've got to do a birthday rep, which was great. And now we're working on the third play about the fall of Rome, called The Song of Rome, which we hope to do whenever theaters are open again. And we may end up doing a weird Zoom version of that. Wow! So keep. Keep your eyes open because I'll be, I'll be posting about that. We'll be able to do it, and I'll be a performer in it. And it's a really crazy piece about Zoom and politics and Rome and America and uh, collaboration. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll, look, we'll look forward to that whenever whenever we can go back to working again. I'm still writing my novel. I'm uh, I've written another. Uh, I think I'm about to about 950 pages now. Wow. So uh, I'm trying to cut it down, and uh, that will be published at some point. So. I'll make it shorter. I'll make it shorter. There's, there's, you know, you always have things going on. You're a busy guy. You always, literally, you wear many hats. I've seen you wear many hats at the same time. See? See that? Now he's a writer. Now he's an actor. Now he's a playwright. So you, all, all kind of different hats. Well, I guess this one, that's going to do it for us, Dennis. Thanks for coming on. And, Thank you, Dom. Thank yeah. you, Dom. You're my favorite. You too, Dennis. Big, Thank big you. And uh, we'll see you over the Zoom session. Shoot. Cool. All right. Bye. 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 Great guy. Great guy. So, Dennis, thanks for joining us. Um, really good Q&A. He's one of my favorite people. Always has so many fun things to talk about. So that's going to do it for this one. Uh, thanks to everybody who watched and everybody who asked questions. Uh, we hope to do this with uh, more clients coming up in the near future. Tomorrow night, we have Dee Wallace coming on, the lovely Dee Wallace from ET and the Howling. She's coming on at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, same same channel as this one, Full Empire Promotions. So join us tomorrow night for Dee. 
and uh, she'll be doing the one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions as well tomorrow. So if you bought your session with Dennis, he'll be doing those in about 10 minutes. So click on the link you got in the email, and uh, we'll see you in the Zoom session. Thanks for joining us.